Maybe we should start talking with about the rabbit hole problem. Uh, this uh, gentleman who I brought a slide up of is Caleb. He posted a video here called My Descent into the Alt-Right Pipeline. He's a major character featured in your documentary. What does Caleb's story exemplify for you? Well, it actually exemplifies that we're beyond the rabbit hole. Um, that there was a period when the YouTube recommender algorithm uh, was aggressively uh, propagandizing viewers because you could go on, if you had a predilection to look at, you know, a, a, an influencer that had a certain type of rhetoric that was fairly benign, uh, you could very quickly get uh, recommended much more extreme uh, influencers and content that would, that would as the term uh, illustrates, would take you down a rabbit hole. It's very difficult to get rabbit hole today. Um, they did, in in fairness to YouTube, do a lot of work on that algorithm. Um, in fact, with Caleb, kind of as a, as a test case, um, we didn't put this in the film because it was pointless, but when I filmed him, which was at the Watergate Hotel because we're, we're cheeky like that, um, we, uh, we did a, a, a test with him where um, I had him go on his laptop and try to rabbit hole himself, and he couldn't. The algorithm just wasn't going to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I was interested in Caleb was – Caleb, you know, was already on his way to towards extremist um, views and YouTube and the influencers they had on there at the time, which were very aggressively extreme extremists uh, like Stefan Molyneux, um, who was a big part of the influence of the uh, the shooter in the in the Christchurch, New Zealand shooting, was heavily influenced by Stefan. And that got Stefan deplatformed eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really about where we are post this rabbit hole idea, the whole idea that misinformation is so proliferate, the monetization of propaganda is so proliferate now um, in our current culture that we're almost all being rabbit hole or, or we're almost all uh, sort of in a blase way accepting of, of misinfo or flat out disinfo. Um, and in Caleb's case, he was kind of pulled out of that extremist thinking by another person on YouTube, which was Natalie Wynn, uh, which we used to kind of prove a point that, you know, the, the some of the harms are here. Uh, but a lot of the antidote for those harms can be found in the same place, can be found in YouTube itself. Yeah, at one point you actually quote Caleb as saying, I wasn't radicalized by YouTube. I was already radicalized. But he was talking about that the videos that he was watching killed his empathy. But then he comes exactly. across contrapoints uh, as she is better known. And it's kind of fascinating that, you know, uh, to to see uh, YouTube is is not, you know, an engine of disaster or to the extent that it is, it also becomes an, an agent of empathy as well. Exactly. I think that that that's really exemplifies the Internet itself. It's the it's the whole spectrum of human um, experience. The the issues to focus on the harms uh, and what I wanted to get at in the film was, A, I wanted to put a human face on all of these issues because I think mm -hmm. that's important. And that's what docs are very good at. You can read a million articles about right. YouTube and about social media and see a million documentaries that don't really humanize a core cast of characters that give you an emotional understanding of the issues at play. Um, and so from the people who actually experienced it, not like actors or reenactments or something. So uh, that was very important to me. But I also wanted to get past this idea of the algorithm, which in, in my opinion is kind of a, a diversion tactic by these monopolized tech companies to just flood you with confusing tech rhetoric that just makes the average person's eyes glaze over. Mm -hmm. And then you never get into the details of how you can maybe make these places work better. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there are algorithms. And yes, there are a lot of engineers who need to be working on algorithms. But most of us are not tech engineers. Most of us right. are, including the people who run Google and YouTube, are just people with basic incentives. Um, and it was these basic incentives that I was most interested in focusing on with this film which in this case is their business model, which is an ad revenue based business model, which is attaches a dollar to content that holds you on platform. And to them, just like the yellow journalists of yesteryear, um, as we all know, the most salacious type of content is normally the most um, ad friendly. And that is the case with YouTube in a way that I think is problematic. So you mentioned that now things have changed and you even tried to get Caleb to rabbit hole himself and could not. Does that indicate to you that something has shifted in the, the incentives? Um, is it 
that the advertisers started to get uncomfortable with the kind of press that YouTube was getting and therefore they decided to shift the algorithm? I mean, how how did the business model work to sort of correct itself in this case? It's the opposite. Um, it's the opposite of, of, of it getting better, of there being less harmful information, of advertisers getting wary. What it, what it was, was that the, they don't need to rabbit hole you to get you to watch salacious content. Disinformation okay. is now pervasive, yeah. right? I mean, I have friends who are on all sides of the political aisle who flirt with extremely bananas uh, theories of mm -hmm. either flat earth or just very cockamamie ideas about about the world that are not fact-based. The sort of non-fact-based uh, culture is pervasive. So you don't need, there's, the incentives aren't there to, to force you algorithmically um, into this, kind, towards this kind of content. As Joe Pulitzer knew in the late 1800s, it's just human nature, right? Yeah. You, you are, you are, pre, are pre-wired to connect more intensely with hyperbolic, angry, negative content than you are with middle of the road, fact-based yeah. content. So it actually, it, they don't need to do that. It's really a human issue. It's the parasocial relationship mm -hmm. of having someone looking into a webcam, like I'm looking at you guys and you're looking back at me. It's that very human, non-algorithmic parasocial component that makes YouTube so powerful. Yeah. And when you, but when you when attach you, that to content, then you can monetize that. Yeah. When you say it's, it's, you know, negative or, you know, and hyperbolic and things like that, how does that explain, you know, the emergence of somebody like Mr. Beast on YouTube, who's one of the largest, um, you know, channels uh, and characters. And it's, if anything, it's relentlessly upbeat. It's like Barney, the dinosaur, you know, post, uh, uh, you know, uh, going through uh, puberty or something like that. Um, is it actually, is it negative, like salacious, negative, hyperbolic? Is that the, is that how they keep people watching or is it more catering to what people are interested in? I think it's both. I think that when you deal with, with media, a media platform as big as YouTube, of which there is no larger media platform, right. Um, you're going to be targeting massively uh, disparate demographics. Uh, Mr. Beast, uh, for instance, my middle school kid loves Mr. Beast and all of his friends in middle school love Mr. Beast, but yeah. I've never watched a single Mr. Beast video in my entire right. life and neither have my two older children. Not one, not a yeah. single one. So um, you're just talking about, about demographics. And I think that's where it's a business model problem because mm. to, to advertisers are looking at a pie chart of numbers and they're not differentiating at all between Mr. Beast and Steven Crowder. Right. But of course there is a difference between Mr. Beast and Steven Crowder because Mr. Beast is like doing yeah. these kind of benign, you know, whatever, come and, and earn a million dollars by jumping off this bridge. And Steven Crowder is calling for civil war after the FBI goes down to Mar-a-Lago to look at, at Trump's classified documents. Right. And, and to, to an advertiser, it's just, it's just data points. It's the same. To return to the uh, ContraPoints, Natalie Wynn example for a second, because what, what I find really interesting about that channel and about what Natalie is doing there is she's kind of embracing this landscape that you're describing or, or just like this is she's just accepting like this is the water we're swimming in. It's a very personal medium. And um, she just directly engages with the culture war arguments Dis dissects the dishonest rhetoric and kind of mm -hmm. jumps into the arena instead of sitting on the sideline begging YouTube to deplatform or demonetize people and does it in a very stylized way, as we can see here. This is kind of the aesthetic established uh, that's designed to maximize engagement, kind of uh, do what you need to do on YouTube to reach an audience and reach outside of an echo chamber and build a following. and in this case, there's evidence that that approach is an effective tactic. What mm -hmm. is your takeaway from what the ContraPoints channel has done? My takeaway is, and I think this is Natalie's having spoken to her about it, is mm -hmm. that you work with the tools you have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you have something that has four, I mean, YouTube has 4.6 or 4.7 billion video views per day. 
So there's a lot of people who don't have the tools at Natalie's disposal. Natalie's working with what Natalie has mm -hmm. uh, to be involved. I know that Natalie, that ContraPoints is very um, supportive of civic engagement and civic response. Um, so, you know, she has been able to build up a massive audience on YouTube, which is extremely rare, I would, yeah. I would also add. Um, so there, it, it is not by any means the only tool that people should be using. Carrie Goldberg is using the tools at her disposal as a lawyer to literally create lawsuits and go after um, for, for very specific harms based on very specific issues on platform. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's incumbent. I mean, my general opinion is it's all hands on deck. Um, I think that because, and, and to be fair to Google, including Google's hands on deck, right? Um, and including fixes from within their own company um, which are basic. I just think that we've never seen in human history a uh, company, this is this industrial revolution, the, the digital technological industrial revolution that we're currently in has moved at an accelerated pace, the likes of which we've never seen. So we're all playing catch up a little bit. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Alex Winter about his new documentary, The YouTube Effect. You can watch another clip right here or the full conversation right here. Do you have an idea for a future guest or future topic? Let us know in the comments and please subscribe for notifications whenever our new videos go live. Our interviews go live every Thursday at 1 p.m. See you there.